Chapter Fifty Five: Moral Standards. It was Satan's studied effort in the antediluvian age to pervert the marriage institution, to weaken its obligations and lessen its sacredness. For in no sure way could he deface the image of God in man and open the door to misery and vice. Satan well knows the material with which he has to deal in the human heart. He knows, for he has studied with fiendish intensity for thousands of years, the points most easily assailed in every character. And through successive generations, he has wrought to overthrow the strongest men, princes in Israel, by the same temptations that were so successful at Baal Peor. All along through the ages, there are strewn wrecks of character that have been stranded upon the rocks of sensual indulgence. The crime that brought the judgments of God upon Israel was that of licentiousness. The forwardness of women to entrap souls did not end at Baal Peor. Notwithstanding the punishment that followed the sinners in Israel, the same crime was repeated many times. Satan was most active in seeking to make Israel's overthrow complete. The licentious practice of the Hebrews accomplished for them that which all the warfare of nations. And the enchantments of Balaam could not do; they became separated from their God. Their covering and protection were removed from them. God turned to be their enemy. So many of the princes and people were guilty of licentiousness that it became a national sin, for God was wroth with the whole congregation. Near the close of this earth's history, Satan will work with all his powers in the same manner, and with the same temptations wherewith he tempted ancient Israel, just before their entering the land of promise. He will lay snares for those who claim to keep the commandments of God, and who are almost on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. He will use his powers to their utmost in order to entrap souls, and to take God's professed people upon their weakest points. Those who have not brought the lower passions into subjection to the higher powers of their being, those who have allowed their minds to flow in a channel of carnal indulgence of the baser passions. Satan is determined to destroy with his temptations, to pollute their souls with licentiousness. He is not aiming especially at the lower and less important marks, but he makes use of his snares through those whom he can enlist as his agents to allure and attract men to take liberties which are condemned in the law of God. And men in responsible positions, teaching the claims of God's law, whose mouths are filled with arguments in vindication of His law, against which Satan has made such a raid, over such, he sets his hellish powers and his agencies at work, and overthrows them upon the weak points in their character. Knowing that he who offends on one point is guilty of all, thus obtaining complete mastery over the entire man. Mind, soul, body, and conscience are involved in the ruin. If he be a messenger of righteousness and has had great light. Or if the Lord has used him as His special worker in the cause of truth, then how great is the triumph of Satan! How he exalts! How God is dishonored! A terrible picture of the condition of the world has been presented before me. 
Immorality abounds everywhere. Licentiousness is the special sin of this age. Never did vice lift its deformed head with such boldness as now. The people seem to be benumbed, and the lovers of virtue and true goodness are nearly discouraged by its boldness, strength, and prevalence. The iniquity which abounds is not merely confined to the unbeliever and the scoffer, would that this were the case, but it is not. Many men and women who profess the religion of Christ are guilty. Even some who profess to be looking for his appearing are no more prepared for that event than Satan himself. They are not cleansing themselves from all pollution. They have so long served their lust that it is natural for their thoughts to be impure and their imaginations corrupt. It is as impossible to cause their minds to dwell upon pure and holy things as it would be to turn the course of Niagara and send its waters pouring up the falls. Every Christian will have to learn to restrain his passions and be controlled by principle. Unless he does this, he is unworthy of the Christian name. Love-sick sentimentalism prevails. Married men receive attention from married or unmarried women. Women also appear to be charmed and lose reason and spiritual discernment and good common sense. They do the very things that the Word of God condemns, the very things that the testimonies of the Spirit of God condemn. Warnings and reproofs are before them in clear lines, yet they go over the same path that others have traveled before them. It is like an infatuating game at which they are playing. Satan leads them on to ruin themselves, to imperil the cause of God, to crucify the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Ignorance, pleasure-loving, and sinful habits, corrupting soul, body, and spirit, make the world full of moral leprosy. A deadly moral malaria is destroying thousands and tens of thousands. What shall be done to save our youth? We can do little. God lives and reigns, and he can do much. The liberties taken in this age of corruption should be no criterion for Christ's followers. These fashionable exhibitions of familiarity should not exist among Christians fitting for immortality. If lasciviousness, pollution, adultery, crime, and murder are the order of the day among those who know not the truth and who refuse to be controlled by the principles of God's Word. How important that the class professing to be followers of Christ, closely allied to God and angels, should show them a better and nobler way. How important that by their chastity and virtue they stand in marked contrast to that class who are controlled by the brute passions. In this degenerate age, 
many will be found who are so blinded to the sinfulness of sin that they choose a licentious life because it suits the natural and perverse inclination of the heart. Instead of facing the mirror of the law of God and bringing their hearts and characters up to God's standard, they allow Satan's agents to erect his standard in their hearts. Corrupt men think it easier to misinterpret the scriptures to sustain them in their iniquity than to yield up their corruption and sin and be pure in heart and life. There are more men of this stamp than many have imagined, and they will multiply as we draw near the end of time. When Satan's bewitching power controls a person, God is forgotten, and man who is filled with corrupt purposes is extolled. Secret licentiousness is practiced by these deceived souls as a virtue. This is a species of witchcraft. There is always a bewitching power in heresies and in licentiousness. The mind is so deluded that it cannot reason intelligently and an illusion is continually leading it from purity. The spiritual eyesight becomes blurred, and persons of hitherto untainted morals become confused under the delusive sophistry of those agents of Satan who profess to be messengers of light. It is this delusion which gives these agents power. They should come out boldly and make their advances openly. They would be repulsed without a moment's hesitation. But they work first to gain sympathy and secure confidence in themselves as holy, self-sacrificing men of God. As his special messengers, they then begin their artful work of drawing away souls from the path of rectitude by attempting to make void the law of God. The mind of a man or woman does not come down in a moment from purity and holiness to depravity, corruption, and crime. It takes time to transform the human to the divine or to degrade those formed in the image of God to the brutal or the satanic. By beholding, we become changed. Though formed in the image of his Maker, man can so educate his mind that sin which he once loathed will become pleasant to him. As he ceases to watch and pray, he ceases to guard the citadel, the heart, and engages in sin and crime. The mind is debased, and it is impossible to elevate it from corruption while it is being educated to enslave the moral and intellectual powers and bring them in subjection to the grosser passions. Constant war against the carnal mind must be maintained, and we must be aided by the refining influence of the grace of God, which will attract the mind upward and habituate it to meditate upon pure and holy things. There is no safety for any man, young or old, unless he feels the necessity of seeking God for counsel at every step. Those only who maintain close communion with God will learn to place his estimate upon men, to reverence the pure, the good, the humble, and the meek. 
The heart must be garrisoned as was that of Joseph. Then temptations to depart from integrity will be met with decision. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The strongest temptation is no excuse for sin. No matter how severe the pressure brought to bear upon you, sin is your own act. The seed of the difficulty is the unrenewed heart. In view of the dangers of this time, shall not we, as God's commandment-keeping people, put away from among us all sin, all iniquity, all perverseness, Shall not the women professing the truth keep strict guard over themselves, lest the least encouragement be given to unwarrantable familiarity? They may close many a door of temptation if they will observe at all times strict reserve and propriety of deportment. I write with a distressed heart that the women in this age, both married and unmarried, too frequently do not maintain the reserve that is necessary. They act like coquettes. They encourage the attentions of single and married men, and those who are weak in moral power will be ensnared. These things, if allowed, deaden the moral senses and blind the mind so that crime does not appear sinful. Thoughts are awakened that would not have been if woman had kept her place in all modesty and sobriety. She may have had no unlawful purpose or motive herself, but she has given encouragement to men who are tempted and who need all the help they can get from those associated with them. By being circumspect, reserved, taking no liberties, receiving no unwarrantable attentions, but preserving a high moral tone and becoming dignity, much evil might be averted. I have long been designing to speak to my sisters and tell them that from what God has been pleased to show me from time to time, there is a great fault among them. They are not careful to abstain from all appearance of evil. They are not all circumspect in their deportment as becoming women professing godliness. Their words are not as select and well chosen as those of women who have received the grace of God should be. They are too familiar with their brethren. They linger around them, incline toward them, and seem to choose their society. They are highly gratified with their attention. From the light which the Lord has given me, our sisters should pursue a very different course. They should be more reserved, manifest less boldness and encourage in themselves shamefacedness and sobriety. Both brethren and sisters indulge in too much jovial talk when in each other's society. Women professing godliness indulge in much jesting, joking, and laughing. This is unbecoming and grieves the Spirit of God. These exhibitions reveal a lack of true Christian refinement. They do not strengthen the soul in God, but bring great darkness. They drive away the pure, refined, heavenly angels and bring those who engage in these wrongs down to a low level. Women are too often tempters. On one pretense or another, they engage the attention of men, married or unmarried, and lead them on till they transgress the law of God, till their usefulness is ruined, 
and their souls are in jeopardy. If women would only elevate their lives and become workers with Christ, there would be less danger through their influence. But with their present feelings of unconcern in regard to home responsibilities and in regard to the claims that God has upon them, their influence is often strong in the wrong direction. Their powers are dwarfed, and their work does not bear the divine impress. There are so many forward misses and bold forward women who have a faculty of insinuating themselves into notice, putting themselves in the company of young men, courting the attentions, inviting flirtations from married or unmarried men, that unless your face is set Christward, firm as steel, you will be drawn into Satan's net. As Christ's ambassador, I entreat you who profess present truth to promptly resent any approach to impurity and forsake the society of those who breathe an impure suggestion. Loathe these defiling sins with the most intense hatred. Flee from those who would, even in conversation, let the mind run in such a channel, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. You should not for one moment give place to an impure, covert suggestion, for even this will stain the soul as impure water defiles the channel through which it passes. A woman who will allow an unchaste word or hint to be uttered in her presence is not as God would have her. One that will permit any undue familiarity or impure suggestion does not preserve her godlike womanhood. Our sisters should encourage true meekness. They should not be forward, talkative, and bold, but modest and unassuming, slow to speak. They may cherish courteousness, to be kind, tender, pitiful, forgiving, and humble, would be becoming and well-pleasing to God. If they occupy this position, they will not be burdened with undue attention from gentlemen in the church or out. All will feel that there is a sacred circle of purity around these God-fearing women, which shields them from any unwarrantable liberties. With some women professing godliness, there is a careless coarse freedom of manner which leads to wrong and evil. But those godly women whose minds and hearts are occupied in meditating upon themes which strengthen purity of life and which elevate the soul to commune with God will not be easily led astray from the path of rectitude and virtue. Such will be fortified against the sophistry of Satan they will be prepared to withstand his seductive arts. I appeal to you, as followers of Christ, making an exalted profession, to cherish the precious, priceless gem of modesty. This will guard virtue. You should control your thoughts. This will not be an easy task. You cannot accomplish it without close and even severe effort, yet God requires this of you. It is a duty resting upon every accountable being. You are responsible to God for your thoughts. If you indulge in vain imaginations, permitting your mind to dwell upon impure subjects, you are in a degree as guilty before God 
as if your thoughts were carried into action. All that prevents the action is the lack of opportunity. Day and night dreaming and castle building are bad and exceedingly dangerous habits. When once established, it is next to impossible to break up such habits and direct the thoughts to pure, holy, elevated themes. I am pained when I see men praised, flattered, and petted. God has revealed to me the fact that some who receive these attentions are unworthy to take his name upon their lips. Yet they are exalted to heaven in the estimation of finite beings who read only from outward appearance. My sisters, never pet and flatter poor, fallible, erring men, either young or old, married or unmarried. You know not their weaknesses, and you know not but that these very attentions and this profuse praise may prove their ruin. I am alarmed at the short-sightedness, the want of wisdom that many manifest in this respect. Men who are doing God's work and who have Christ abiding in their hearts will not lower the standard of morality but will ever seek to elevate it. They will not find pleasure in the flattery of women or in being petted by them. Let men, both single and married, say, Hands off. I will never give the least occasion that my good should be evil spoken of. My good name is capital of far more value to me than gold or silver. Let me preserve it untarnished. If men assail that name, it shall not be because I have given them occasion to do so, but for the same reason they spoke evil of Christ, because they hated the purity and holiness of his character, for it was a constant rebuke to them. The slightest insinuations from whatever source they may come inviting you to indulge in sin or to allow the least unwarrantable liberty with your persons should be resented as the worst of insults to your dignified womanhood. The kiss upon your cheek at an improper time and place should lead you to repel the emissary of Satan with disgust. If it is from one in high places who is dealing in sacred things, the sin is of tenfold greater magnitude and should lead a God-fearing woman or youth to recoil with horror, not only from the sin he would have you commit, but from the hypocrisy and villainy of one whom the people respect and honor as God's servant. If a minister of the gospel does not control his baser passions, if he fails to follow the example of the apostle and so dishonors his profession and faith as to even name the indulgence of sin, our sisters who profess godliness should not for an instant flatter themselves that sin or crime loses its sinfulness in the least because their minister dares to engage in it. The fact that men who are in responsible places show themselves to be familiar with sin should not lessen the guilt and enormity of the sin in the minds of any. Sin should appear just as sinful, just as abhorrent as it had been heretofore regarded, and the minds of the pure and elevated should abhor and shun the one who indulges in sin, 
as they would flee from a serpent whose sting was deadly. If the sisters were elevated and possessed purity of heart, any corrupt advances even from their minister would be repulsed with such positiveness as would never need a repetition. Be faithful to marriage vows. How careful should the husband and father be to maintain his loyalty to his marriage vows? How circumspect should be his character, lest he should encourage thoughts in young girls or even in married women that are not in accordance with the high holy standard, the commandments of God? Those commandments Christ shows to be exceedingly broad, reaching even the thoughts, intents, and purposes of the heart. Here is where many are delinquent. Their heart imaginings are not of the pure, holy character which God requires. And however high their calling, however talented they may be, God will mark iniquity against them and will count them as far more guilty and deserving of his wrath than those who have less talent, less light, less influence. To married men I am instructed to say, it is to your wives, the mothers of your children, that your respect and affection are due. Your attentions are to be given to them, and your thoughts are to dwell upon plans for their happiness. I have been shown families where the husband and father has not preserved that reserve, that dignified, godlike manhood which is befitting a follower of Christ. He has failed to perform the kind, tender, courteous acts due to his wife whom he has promised before God and angels to love, respect, and honor, while they both shall live. The girl employed to do the work has been free and somewhat forward to dress her hair and to be affectionately attentive, and he is pleased, foolishly pleased. In his love and attention to his wife, he is not as demonstrative as he once was. Be sure that Satan is at work here. Respect your hired help. Treat them kindly, considerately, but go no farther. Let your department be such that there will be no advances to familiarity from them. Maintain family privacy. Oh, how many lives are made bitter by the breaking down of the walls which enclose the privacies of every family and which are calculated to preserve its purity and sanctity. A third person is taken into the confidence of the wife and her private family matters are laid open before the special friend. This is the device of Satan to estrange the hearts of the husband and wife. Oh, that this would cease. What a world of trouble would be saved. Lock within your own hearts the knowledge of each other's faults. Tell your troubles alone to God. He can give you right counsel and sure consolation which will be pure, having no bitterness in it. When a woman relates her family troubles or complains of her husband to another man, she violates her marriage vows. She dishonors her husband and breaks down the wall erected to preserve the sanctity of the marriage relation. She throws wide open the door and invites Satan to enter with his insidious temptations. 
this is just as Satan would have it. If a woman comes to a Christian brother with a tale of her woes, her disappointments, and trials, he should ever advise her, if she must confide her troubles to someone, to select sisters for her confidence, and then there will be no appearance of evil whereby the cause of God may suffer reproach. I speak to our people. If you draw close to Jesus and seek to adorn your profession by a well-ordered life and godly conversation, your feet will be kept from straying into forbidden paths. If you will only watch, continually watch unto prayer, if you will do everything as if you were in the immediate presence of God, you will be saved from yielding to temptation and may hope to be kept pure, spotless and undefiled to the last. If you hold the beginning of your confidence firm unto the end, your ways will be established in God, and what grace has begun, glory will crown in the kingdom of our God. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If Christ be within us, we shall crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts.